and we we can start on uh, IPv6. But in fact, uh, I'm not going to start uh, by myself. But you have to tell me what you remember about uh, IPv6. What's that? Okay, so what we can say is that IPv4 is done, at least in terms of addresses, because we have no more uh, IP address in some uh, area of the world. For example, in, in Asia, we don't have any more IPv4 address, and in Europe, it will be at the end of uh, June. So that's the problem, because we cannot create new addresses. Okay, so what happened is that we got a new protocol called IPv6. So what are the difference between IPv4 and IPv6? Okay, the address length is we go from 32 bits in IPv4 to 128 bits in, in IPv6. In fact, we don't really change the fields. We reorder the field and we suppress the fields that were not very well used in, in IPv4. But we don't accept flow label. Um, we don't know really what to do with uh, flow label. Ex except flow label, the rest is almost the same. But the name change, the size may change. For example, the address is now four times bigger than in IPv4, but it's uh, you have you find almost the same field. So that's something. Yes, in IPv4 we have lost this end-to-end -end communication because we don't have enough addresses. So in IPv4, what people did is to put NAT network address translators in the middle of the network or at some place in the network, which means that when you do that, you can. So here you can use private addresses. Here you can use, you are obliged to use public addresses to reach everybody's. And when you cross the NAT, we change the pri private address to a public address. And what we can do, what is the magic of NAT? First is that in the first approach, we just need public addresses for active flows. So if I have plenty of computers here, and only one is sending information, then I need only one public address. But that's not enough. And what people have done after that is that they can change a port number. And here, you may have different computers that will use, or different flows, that will use the same address, but a different port number. And what we saw in Mexico is that the port number, the public port number, identify your connection. So that's uh, a good thing, because now you can have more than one e equipment behind one address. So you can extend the network without needing so much addresses, new addresses. But the drawback is that it's very difficult to have incoming calls. Because here, if you don't have a context, then you cannot reach the destination. So in IPv6, normally, you suppress NAT. You have enough addresses. So you can do end-to-end -end between any equipment. So that's um, um, the official uh, talk, or the official way to say that IPv6 is better. In fact, it's not so true. Because end-to-end -end means that everybody can reach your computer. And so if you install your computer in your home and you are attack, uh, you will not like it. So NAT is not really a protection, because NAT doesn't f uh, block everything. But it's complex to cross a NAT, so you have a, a certain security feeling inside your domain. But it's just a feeling. It means that if someone wants to attack you, he can do it. But it will be complex, so it has a cost to do, to do that. So in IPv6, everybody will be reachable. But 
no, not everybody likes to be reachable. So we have to introduce again some security mechanism that are not necessary in IPv4. So that's a, a big problem because we don't have a lot of security mechanism. So currently what we can do, for example, is instead of a NAT in IPv6, you put a router and you filter all incoming call. So this way, only device inside your home or your network can live outside. So that's just a configuration of your router. And if you see a thing packet, for example, coming from outside, then you block it. And if you see a thing packet coming from your area, then you allow it. So this is one possibility. The, the problem is that here, of course, if you want to do SIP, for example, you are now a specialist of SIP. So I want to receive RTP flow from outside. So maybe it will be complex if my router is filtering things. So it means that I will need a clever router to, to do filtering. So this is one approach. And next week, during the, um, the workshop on the communicating objects, we will see different architecture. And we will focus on M2M architecture from Etsy. And in the M2M architecture from Etsy, what do you have? You have, for example, an area here, your home, or your company, or a city where you will have a network, for example, what we call wireless sensor networks, and you will have device here that will use IPv6 because it's easy to configure devices using IPv6 because the address is very, very big. So you can put an identifier as interface identifier. And what, so here we have some work that is done at the ITF to manage this kind of network. So some groups we will see in the, the future, for example, six Lopan, that allow you to adapt IPv6 to this kind of networks. You have Ripple, or the work, uh, whole working group that create a Ripple mechanism. And we are, uh, Ripple is a routing protocol. And uh, next Tuesday, you will see one of the developer of Ripple that will make a talk during the, the workshop. And so Ripple work in new ceiling. It means that you don't have always the connection. The, the quality of li link is very, very bad. So you, you cannot run a standard routing protocol on that. So you have this. And you have another group that is called Core. And this group is, create, is using a co-op. It's defining a co-op protocol. And this allow you to make a gateway here. And in fact, you will receive requests, for example, HTTP uh, request. And so here it's HTTP based on TCP and maybe IPv4. And here you will transform this request into co-op so it is a protocol which is more simpler than HTTP. It is based on UDP. And then you will have six low pan. And so here you can reach this equipment. So here we are IPv6. Here we are IPv4. And the gateway is just changing URL. So what does it mean here? It means that you don't have end-to-end -end connectivity. You have IPv6 just in one area, and you have something else on the other area. And the interconnection between area is done at layer 7. So that's a different view from what we, we say about IPv6. It says that we have 60 uh, trillion of trillion of addresses per inhabitant. So we can create a layer 3, a global layer 3 network. What we see now is that Maybe it will not be a global Leo3 network, but a local Leo3 network, and then you interconnect it at the upper level. And this way, you can introduce a security mechanism 
pricing mechanism, etc., on the gateway. On HC, so European Telecommunications Standard, Standard Institute, is currently designing this gateway on a group which is called machine-to-machine -machine communication. And uh, for the one next uh, workshop, you will have also Omar El Oumi, uh, with uh, the chair of M2M group, that will present this kind of architecture. So what will be very interesting for us and for me, I, there is some very basic specification of gateway, but not a very specialized one. And so it will be interesting to see what kind of functionality will be uh, put in this kind of gateway and how we can re uh, implement it. So that's some of the things we want to know dur during this, uh, this workshop. So just, it was a parenthesis, just to introduce um, some uh, aspects of the workshop. So, of course, the official discourse for IPv6 is that you can reach everything, everybody, but in practice, I'm not sure that you will really use the end-to-end -end everywhere. But the advantage of end-to-end -end is that when I'm designing here, this network, I have no problem. I can reach any equipment without uh, any uh, NAT or device that will block what I want to do. But I will continue to block somewhere because full end-to-end -end connectivity is not uh, a good thing. Mm, yes or no? I, w I will not say that uh, IPv4 or IPv6 is better for multicast. It's, uh, always, it's complex in uh, every case. So when you have to manage a big network with a multicast routing protocol, you just have some extra feature. For example, if you have a rendezvous point, in IPv4, it's complex to implement. In IPv6, you can embed your rendezvous point into the multicast address, IPv6 multicast address. So this way it is the way you manage a big multicast network. But normally, you will not run big multicast networks. So if you run multicast network, it will be inside your company network because you want to to broadcast some information or you want to to make uh, television over IP and this way you will create your multicast network but you will not interconnect it with other companies to create a worldwide multicast network. So in that sense IPv6 is not better, much better than IPv4. In uh, the main difference is that in IPv4, you are using broadcast. So when you have some information, you transform it into a broadcast frame at layer 2, and you flood all your network. In IPv6, you have this, uh, what you say, solicited address, that says that instead of sending it to everybody on my link, I just send it to one guy on the link. So that's optimization compared to IPv4. And we'll see that it works well um, in Ethernet. But when we want to, to go to wireless sensor network, for example here, we are going to avoid even multicast. Because multicast is very complex to implement and require a lot of energy. So I will, if I am a salesman for IPv6, I will not use multicast as a way to sell it. Yes, number discovery is something which is better engineer than what we have in IPv4 with address resolution protocol, RP, because we don't use multicast, we use solicited address. We d it's not a novel protocol, it's something that is directly embedded into IPv6 using MC and PV6. So that's something that is with just better design. And one new functionality we don't have in IPv4 is that it's address auto configuration. So in IPv4, you, since the address is very, very small, you don't have a lot of uh, room to number interfaces. So what we call in IPv6 interface identifier, but we can also uh, use it for IPv4. So the interface ID is at least, at most, sorry, 
8 bit long in good cases. So it means that here you have 256 values. So you need some clever man to assign these things. So it may be the network engineer, but we say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or a DHCP server that will tell this value, this value, this value, and you will use unused value. In IPv6, the interface ID part is much, much longer since it's half of the address size, it's 64 bits. And so here you can either use random number. It's what now we almost recommend when you are using your uh, PC. So it's what Windows is doing. So draw a random number when you start your computer. And in wireless sensor network, it could be used, for example, to put the MAC address of the, dev of the device. So this way, it's also a way to identify this equipment outside of your network. So here we have enough room to do it, because 2 power 64 is a very, very large number. And so we can have auto-configuration. And that's something that is very interesting in, uh, in IPv6, because if I want to manage uh, this kind of network, where a sensor network, where you don't have a keyboard, a screen to configure a sensor. So auto configuration is a good uh, opportunity. When with the chippy? I don't know. Mm. It yes. For example, uh, when you are using the chippy and you connect your laptop to the wireless network here, your address may change every day. Every time you connect, you will have another address. It's not like the, like the no. And, for example, in ADSL in France, I don't think it's the case in Mexico, but at home, some provider, so what you have what we call in uh, official name is CPE, Customer Premise Equipment, but in France we call it a box. So it's a router with other functionalities, like telephony, television, etc., etc. So here you receive a public address from your provider, and for example, France Telecom is changing the address every five days, or three or five days. So even if in, I am in my home, here my IP address is stable, but when I cross NAT, then my address may change every three or five days. Some other provider maintains the stability of the address. So that's a problem because we don't have a lot of addresses right now. So maybe you can reuse the same address for different persons. And we will see during the class that we, since IPv4, we have a, a paradox. Because we have no more IPv4 addresses, but user still wants to continue to use IPv4. If you want to go to Facebook, um, surely you will go in IPv4. There is some IPv6 addresses. But most of the people access through IPv4. Even if you know the IPv6 address, maybe you are connected to a network that doesn't have IPv6. So you are forced, obliged to continue to use IPv4. And so we have to find tricks to continue to use IPv4 even if we don't have enough addresses. So we will see that uh, when we will study the, the transi transition. A computer, you create a link local address, which is FEAT and your interface ID. Then normally, you do a stateless address uh, automatic configuration. So it's neighbor discovery protocol. And you receive a global prefix plus a subnet ID. And you add your interface ID. So this way you configure automatically and then you can use both of these addresses. You use link local address if you want to talk with an equipment on your link, a router, for example. And if you want to talk to something else, you use the global address. Since we have a protocol which is much, much better, it's IPv6, why don't you use it right now? 
when I was at ITAM, I didn't get any IPv6 addresses. Here, normally you may have, in some cases, IPv6 addresses, not always, not always the case. I will explain you why, but it's not something very popular. So why people don't use IPv6, even right now, where at the time we don't have any more IPv4 addresses? It's not um, yes or no. We we don't have to change all the equipment. If you are running a network at uh, layer two, your switches may be used to switch IPv4 or IPv6. Your access point can run IPv4 or IPv6. So you can introduce quite easily IPv6 a, in your network. Yes. So, so that, that's a good reason. Is that engineers, system engineers are very lazy and they think they are as good in their company because they know about net mask and things like this in IPv4. And when you show to him an IPv6 address, he will be afraid, say, I don't understand what it is, and say, this thing is stupid. I prefer to continue to use IPv4. So you, you, you have this feeling that IPv6 is complex, and so people don't use it. So that's a psychologic, psychological factor, but it's an important factor. So that's why training is very important to understand that IPv6 is not much complex as IPv4. In some cases, it's much, much more simpler than IPv4 because you don't play with bits. You play with uh, prefixes, so it's easier to, to play because you you don't have to look at, for example, when I give an address, I will just play with multiple of four for the prefix length. And so it will be a number, an hexadecimal number here. And so it's easier to manage that when I, when I give you something, uh, uh, let's say 202, 155, 109, uh, 73, 75.19. When I give you that, if I ask you what is the value of the prefix, you will not be able to answer very quickly because 19 is 16 plus 3 bit. So I have to convert 105 in binary to look at the value of the uh, leftmost uh, bi three bits, the three leftmost bits of the value here to know the prefix. So in IPv4, it's complex. But you are used to, and you say it's simple. In IPv6, it's much more simpler, but you are not used to, so you will say it's complex. So that's a psychological uh, thing. And we have another problem is that, uh, for example, you don't have IPv6 access. So that's the reason you don't use it, because you don't have it. So it's something very, very common. There is also some uh, other things. For example, I told you that you can run an IPv6 network on almost any kind of equipment, but it's quite hard to manage. And for example, in, uh, we talked already about that. In IPv4, I have a DHCP that gives addresses to equipment. In IPv6, it's not me as a network manager that give addresses to equipment, but equipment find themselves via addresses and sometimes use a random number to draw the interface ID. Or draw a random number for the interface ID. So it means that as a network manager, when I see an address, I cannot tell you to whom it belongs. So it means that here I lost control on my network. I have a virus on a laptop in my company. I have hundred and or thousands of thousands of computers, and I cannot locate, know which guy has the virus, because the guy has his own address. So I need some management tools to use IPv6. And currently, we don't have this tool on company networks. So that's a, that's a big problem. But we are going to, to see, little by little, how we can introduce IPv6 in, uh, in networks. Okay, 
So, you are, oh, it's almost, I don't know if you read the slide, but it means that uh, now we have no more IPv4 addresses. We can continue to use IPv4 for many, many years because uh, there is some tricks to do it, but it will be more and more complex and more and more expensive to do it. So the only alternative we have is to move to IPv6. And normally it will be uh, cheaper. But the problem is that you move to a network only if the other move. The other moves. Because if they don't move, you may be, uh, be the only one to run IPv6. It's good for you. You can say it, claim everywhere. We have IPv6, we have IPv6. But you will have a very, very low IPv6 traffic because rest of the world is in IPv4. So that's, prob that's a problem and we have to find some way to break what we call this chicken-egg problem. It means that if I don't have IPv6, I don't have IPv6 because the other don't have IPv6 and since the other I don't have IPv6, I don't have IPv6 and nobody moves. So we have to, to find a way to, to do it. There is a lot of um, problem with IPv4, we know, but IPv4 is running. And for example, when you design an application, you, you create your startup to sell a new application on the internet. You, you know that IPv6 is better, but you will not do it in IPv6 because you know that nobody has IPv6. So if you create something that is purely IPv6, nobody will buy it. So what do you do? You create something with IPv6, maybe, because you like IPv6, and something with IPv4. And everybody will use the IPv4 side and not the IPv6 side. So it means that you still need to make, even if you know that IPv6 will simplify your life, you will have always to make complex things to have IPv4 on it. So it's better just to have IPv4. So. If we look at all these systems, so we have different uh, kind of systems. So some of them where we don't have any problem. Here is the simplest one. The first case is I have an IPv4 host that want to talk with another IPv4 host, and they are connected connected by an IPv4 network. So, here, so here, nothing special to do because it's the situation we have for many, many years. Now, we have the opposite, where you have everywhere IPv6. And here, you don't have any problem at all, because it's a new network. You have built in using IPv6, so you use IPv6 feature and you have any trouble. So for, this is, for example, the case of wireless sensor networks. Wireless sensor network has just designed in IPv6. So 6 Lopan, Ripple, uh, are only made for IPv6 and not for other kind of uh, protocol. So if you deploy IETF solution, it will be in IPv6. You will see also uh, intelligent transportation system. So it's network in your car. And these networks are also designed only for IPv6. The reason is that when the product will appear, it's in two or three years, then IPv6 will be here. So it's not a problem. Currently, we are in a transition period, so it's more complex. But in the future, of course, the only consensus is that we will have IPv6. So it's becoming more complex. For example, if I have IPv6 equipment that talk on an IPv4 network, or vice versa, I have IPv4 equipment that 
work on an IPv6 network. So, but you remember very well what we saw during the class in Mexico. And you know that we have some solutions. You remember some of these solutions? Sorry? Encapsulation, so tunneling. It's a possibility. So we can create tunnel inside the network. So I have my IPv6 packet. I put an IPv4 header. And I send it on the network. So this is one solution. Another solution is not really a tunnel, is to use MPLS. And using MPLS, you can isolate. So here, for example, I have a provider. I can be viewed as an IPv6 network from outside. But internally, I can continue to run IPv4. And here, I will have some LSPs that will carry IPv6 traffic. So here my P router will continue to be IPv4. So the only investment is on edge routers that will be able to must be able to talk IPv4 and IPv6. So we already saw some uh, solution. We will see it again a little bit. It's for example 6PE 6 provider edge that allow you to create, so to talk in BGP and IPv4 internally, to create MPLS LSP, and this MPLS LSP will carry IPv6 traffic. So this is one, uh, one solution, and it's not so difficult to, to do. But uh, I'm not so optimistic as the slide, but say that there is no real problem. In fact, there is some problems. For example, management, security. Because you don't manage the same way IPv4 and IPv6. So maybe you will have some missing tools. Another problem that you may have with IPv6 is bugs. Because in IPv4, you have bugs, of course. But it runs for 30 years, and a lot of bugs have disappeared. When you push a new protocol, of course, you introduce new bugs and you may have some, uh, some trouble. So running in production network IPv6 sometimes is not so, so obvious. But of course, this problem will disappear with, uh, with time. Last thing, it means that I have somewhere, so I don't know what I have in the middle here. But here I have something that IPv6 equipment that wants to talk with IPv4 equipment. So here it's uh, much more difficult to do because these two protocols are incompatible. You cannot, if I am IPv6 uh, equipment uh, device, I'm sending an IPv6 packet to something that is running for many, many years on the internet and has never heard about IPv6. The good case is that the packet is dropped because he doesn't know about this protocol. The receiver doesn't know about this protocol. But sometimes it can even break or make a core dump of the equipment, of the device. So here we don't have direct communication. And that's the problem of IPv6. Because most of the information is on IPv4. And you have very, very few information in IPv6. So people want to go to where the information is, so wants to stay with IPv4. So if we had the magic NAT, that will be able to do the transition, totally, uh, totally, totally invisible transition between the IPv6 world and IPv4 world, then it will be correct. It will be fine, because in IPv6, we will have all the information we have in IPv4. But we don't have this magic NAT. We have some solution like NAT64 that allows you to transform IPv6 header into an IPv4 header. So this is one, uh, one solution. But it, it doesn't scale very well. 
So it means that for a small network, you can do it. For a very large network, if you want, you are Telmex, and, I, and you say, I'm putting all my Telmex customer in IPv6, and I interconnect the rest of the world in IPv4 using NAT64, it will not work. So we have, there is a lot of scalability issues here. So there is no magic solution to make IPv4 a device talk with IPv6 devices. So that's uh, also a problem that we will have to solve and we will see some, uh, some solution to, to do that. So, and here, for this case, we don't have for four, uh, five and six, there is not only one solution. It means that every company, every kind, every application will lead to another uh, different solution. So here you have, you need some expertise to say, okay, you have this kind of uh, application that is using this protocol, so you can use this kind of, this category of solution. Your company is, uh, has a lot of uh, contact with Asia. Asia is moving to IPv6, so maybe it's good just to put your web server in IPv6 and the rest of your network continue to be IPv4. So you don't have a unique solution, it depends on a lot of things. So uh, we, we are lacking of expertise at this point, to, to give you a, a, a complete view of the transition. We have some solutions for some places of the problem, but not for all of them. Yes? So IPv6 broker is a way to get IPv6 connectivity when I just have IPv4 connectivity. So it can be viewed here. But I will give you another classification of, of things. Here is just a vision of connectivity, but we, we can uh, see uh, other solutions. So here, for example, you have some uh, solution to, to do the, the translation. So of course, if you have IPv4 and IPv6, then we have what we call dual stack. So it means that you run IPv4 and IPv6 on the same network. So the advantage, and normally what is planned by, uh, by IETF is to say that when I have IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity, I try first in IPv6 and then, if it doesn't work, I will use IPv4. So this way, IPv6 is better, is, could be, should be more used than IPv4. So dual stack is, uh, is a good approach if, for example, in your home, you may have your box or your CPE that gives you two prefixes, one IPv4 and one IPv6. And the, uh, depending on what kind of equipment you have, you will use IPv4 and IPv6. So here it's good for unmanaged network because there is no management. But for managed network, like a company network, a provider network, if you are running dual stack, it means that you double your costs because you have to manage two networks at a time. So it's maybe much more complex and much more costly. So for this, uh, and we will see that a lot of providers say I'm dual stack, but in fact they are offering IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes, but they are tunneling IPv4 over IPv6 or IPv6 over IPv4. And in fact, they are just managing one network or for one forwarding plan, either IPv4 or IPv6. So we are, we are going to, to see that. So another way to allow communication is to use tunneling. So tunneling is, for example, to carry IPv4 packets on IPv6 or vice versa. So when currently IPv4 is everywhere. So what we can do is to put IPv6 pack frame into IPv4. And this way we get an IPv6 connectivity. So it's a case of tunnel broker or IPv6 broker. It means that you, can, you contact a system that say I want IPv6 and then you create a tunnel with this equipment and you receive the information. 
So that's a good uh, thing. So tunnel broker is what we call configure tunnels. So it means that statically you put an IPv4 address of the other end. And you have also automatic tunnels, and we will see some examples of automatic tunnels. It means that you take, for example, the IPv6 address. Inside the IPv6 address, you have the IPv4 address. And you take this IPv4 address to find the other point, the end point of your tunnel. So if you have different addresses, you will have different end points. With static tunnel, you have only one uh, solution. So this is to create uh, tunnel. So tunnel can be viewed at a very, very uh, large, with a very, very large definition. For example, 6PE, so the solution with MPLS, can be viewed also in this kind of category. You, of course, you don't tunnel, but you put a, a label inside, and this label has the same functionality as a tunnel. So this is for access network. And you have another category, of course, is how I can talk. I am in IPv4 and I want to talk with IPv6. I am in IPv6 and I want to talk with IPv4. And here you have two, two solutions. One is to use either translation. So it means that it's like a NAT, but a NAT that will have IPv4 in one uh, entry and IPv6 on the other entry the other interface. So it's something that is now used, but as I say, you don't, you cannot do it for a very, very large network. And another solution is to use relays, application gateways, where you have, for example, a web server and the, your web server or your web proxy is able to talk in one interface in IPv4 or another interface in IPv6. And it's, for example, the example in uh, M2M. I talk about M2M uh, architecture, where you can create here a wireless sensor network using IPv6, because IPv6 allows you auto configuration. And here you put a gateway, and you query this gateway using IPv4 because IPv4, until now, now offer you a global connectivity. So it's a way. So here you are at home in um, your network in Mexico. You have only IPv4. You want to know the temperature of this room. So you can send a request, and the request will reach a gateway, and the gateway will transform into IPv6. You will get a result, and this result will be sent back to you. So here, it's only in IPv4, and here, it will be in IPv6. So it's another solution, but of course, it's not a generic solution. Relay, a translation, a translation is generic because you work at layer 3. Here, it's more designed for application. So if I do it for wireless sensor network, it will not be the same thing for mail. I will have to run another gateway to uh, interface mail. So, you don't have a unique solution at this point. So here, it's the same thing, but with some, uh, some drawing. So I will uh, skip this. We have already uh, seen that. So tunneling, we have already uh, seen this kind of thing. So just uh, here, to see some technology we are going to, to study in more details. So there is something that now is almost obsolete. It is called 6 to 4. But instead of 6 to 4, now we have another technology called 6RD. And 6RD is something that has better property than 6 to 4. And this 6RD is now very wide used, widely used. So we'll see it in more details after that. You have another solution which is called Teredo. And Teredo is something that is very ugly. I, uh, because uh, if you, you go to the web, 
if I can go to the web and type tirido and ask for pictures you see that it's a very ugly animal and Teredo, in fact, it's a worm that is on a boat and make a hole in a boat. Okay, and then the boat sink. So it's not a, a, a good solution. In fact, it's a solution that has been developed by Microsoft. And the idea was to say, okay, I am going to make a hole in my NAT to get IPv6. And so the first version of this protocol was called Shipworm. But, so Microsoft published that, but some people at Microsoft say it's not a good solution to call uh, something warm at Microsoft because uh, sometimes we have some security problem. So we are going to use the Latin name of Shipworm and it's Teredo. So that's uh, why we have this uh, Strange name, it is not an acronym, it's the name of this uh, very, very uh, beautiful animal. <laughs> you can go to Saint Malo and during this weekend and try to, to find some. So, what we. Yes, do you have a question? Yes. There is a is No, it's not Teredo. Uh, L2TP is, um, we have a solution and we are very proud because uh, I am one of the co authors of this RFC, is to use L2TP to get IPv6 connectivity. It's something called Softwire. And uh, we will describe it in the future. But here, the idea is to get an unmanaged network. So you have your laptop here. You don't know anything about networking, but you will get an IPv6 address from somewhere. And this way you can have a IPv6 connectivity. And six, so 624, we are going to see it in details, but 624 works only if you don't have NAT. And Teredo works if you have NAT. That's why you have your worm that make a hole in your NAT. But the problem is that this solution, automatic solution to get IPv6, leads to a very bad quality of the connection. And most of the case, when you get this automatic tunnel, you don't know where it goes. For example, you are in France and it, you will send your packet to Switzerland, and from Switzerland you will go back to France in IPv6. So it means that you don't have a good quality of service. And that's a problem because, as I told you, when you have a dual stack, and we have a dual stack because we have IPv4, native IPv4 on a transition, uh, uh, one of these uh, technologies, 624 or Teredo, then you have IPv6 with a bad quality. But your system will prefer IPv6 because IPv6, it says, better than IPv4. So it means that you have something that works well in IPv4, this thing arrives on your network, you don't know by, uh, from where. You get a bad quality in IPv6 and you use it. So what will be your answer to IPv6? IPv6 is bad, I disable it from my computer. So that's uh, a problem. For example, Google is available in IPv6. So when you type www.google dot com on your DNS, you will receive only an IPv4 address. But if your network is registered as a good network, then Google will give you also an IPv6 address. So why Google is doing that at the moment is because if you have Teredo or another uh, or 624, then you will select this solution and you will have bad response from Google. So you will say, okay, Google doesn't work very well. 
I am using Yahoo because Yahoo is only an IPv4 and I have better connectivity. So that's a problem with this transmission mechanism, uh, transmission mechanism that don't, doesn't offer you a good quality of service or a quality equivalent as a, to IPv4. So we have isotap, but isotap is, uh, we, I think we will see an example, but is when you have um, your network, your company network is on IPv4, and you say to your manager, I have to work on a project on IPv6, so I need IPv6 connectivity. And so your manager will not change all your company network just for you. So it's a way to tunnel IPv6 packet inside your company network. So this solution <coughs> are not very frequently used. Even if you, if you switch on your Windows, you will see that you have a 624 interface and Teredo interface, and maybe they are active right now. But, so millions and millions of people have this solution, but they are not so, so good. Isotap is for a very few people, but 6PE, 6PE based on MPLS is something that is uh, really, really used by providers. So here you have a very complex slide to give you uh, very simple things. So I will uh, not uh, describe this, but here you have just X and Y that are 6 or 4 or 4 and 6. So you can play it in, in both ways. So here, for example, for translation, I am sending a packet from A to, to C and I will put an address and this address destination address here will be derived from the address uh, I got officially so we are, we are going to see that in uh, example and same thing for tunneling but this is uh, not uh, very important so if we talk about uh, Transition. Where are we right now? So uh, now, last year, people maybe have said IP IPv6 is just a dream from researchers, and so we don't have to put IPv6. But if you look now at the message from everybody, everybody knows that IPv6 will come one day. The question is when. But now everybody is sure that IPv6 will be here. So IPv6 is already, already at a lot of places. For example, all of your, all your laptops here have an IPv6 stack. If you have a mobile phone, uh, an iPhone or an uh, Android phone, you have IPv6 in your pocket. So, you, so IPv6 is uh, Nokia or, uh, has also IPv6 for a long, long, long uh, period of time. So, but nobody used Nokia. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I don't know for BlackBerry if they have uh, IPv6. I'm not sure. Uh, so, in the most of the computer now you have IPv6. Linux, MicroOS, uh, Windows, uh, all these operating systems have, uh, have IPv6. They may try to force the use of IPv6 in the case of Microsoft, but for the operating system, it's no more a problem. Application, it can be a problem because you may have some legacy application on your laptop and they cannot run, or your company application, maybe they are not compiled to use IPv6. So it can be a problem. But if you look at popular uh, protocol uh, application like Netsc uh, Firefox, uh, Chrome, uh, iTunes, etc., they are using IPv6. So you can run it, run them on, on IPv6. So uh, you have this. So for your user, uh, it's if when you look at a switch, switch is layer two. So you can for, uh, forward or switch for packets containing or frames containing IPv4, IPv6 packets. So it's absolutely not a problem to run IPv6 on this layer two equipment, except that when you will use IPv6, 
you may need some other functionality that doesn't exist right now. So one of them, but you may take care, for example, when you are using multicast in your switch, what do you do? So you have a server that is sending a multicast flow, so using an IPv4 address, for example, 235, sorry, dot zero dot zero dot one. So we are sending inf flooding information on your network with a video flow, for example. So normally at layer two, it's converted to a MAC address, a multicast MAC address, and your switch will send it on all the ports. But maybe only this equipment and this equipment or this uh, device and this device are interested by this flow. So here you are sending things for nothing on all the other ports. So normally if you follow all the standards, there is a protocol called GARP at layer 2 that allows you to register if you are interested by a multicast group. But nobody uses GARP. So what do you do when you are interested by a group? you send an IGMP message. So I IGMP message say to, to the router here, I am interested by your flow. But this is a layer 3 message. So normally it's totally transparent for the switch. But in fact, most of the advanced switch, what do they do? They look at IGMP message, what we call IGMP spoofing, uh, snooping, sorry, and doing IGMP snooping, they'll know that they just have to send this information to this port and this port, and they don't send it on other ports. So here your switch has been optimized for IPv4. Now I move my application to IPv6, so I send a flow. And this flow will have an IPv6 address, FF, let's say 0, 5, column, column, 1. And here I'm sending things on my switch, but my switch doesn't know MLD, Multicast Listener Discovery, which is the equivalent of IGMP in IPv6. This one is based on ICMPv6. And my old switch will ignore it. So in that case, I will send the multicast flow everywhere. So that's a problem. IPv6 will not be as good as IPv4. Of course, you don't use, normally you don't use a lot of multicast flow, so it's not a big problem. But it can be an issue in your system. Another example, but this example is, uh, uh, you can, so now you find equipment, a uh, piece of equipment that use MLD snooping, new one, so they can be designed for IPv6. But you, there is other problems. For example, I told you that when I configure my computer, I receive a global prefix from an SID some uh, site, site ID from the network, from my router, and then I put a random value to identify my interface ID. So I cannot identify, nobody knows who am I. And that's logic, because it's something to guarantee privacy. But in a company network, it's not good to have privacy because if you have a trouble, you have to locate where the trouble is. And here you don't know by looking at the IP address. And if I am after one or two routers, I don't have the MAC address of the equipment. So I cannot locate it. So it can be very complex. So one possibility, and we, we are working on that at uh, Telecom Bretagne, is for example, to guarantee that your switch or your uh, access point is able to make the link between the identity 
on the IP address. So for example, when I'm connecting to an access point, I have to give my name and my password, and then I have access to the network. So I give my identity. Then I do a DAD. So after the DAD, I give my IP address. And so my switch or my access point is able to make the link between identity and IP address. And this way I can have a list of all the IP address and send that to a manager that will be able to, to keep a list, to keep track of IP address and identity, which can be used also for firewalls, etc., etc. But none of these things exist right now in uh, the devices. So here is science fiction. So if you, uh, if you are a manager and you want to manage an IP network, an IPv6 network, so you will use DHCP because with DHCP you can control who can access to your network. But it's an old-fashioned way. So new-fashioned way will be to use 802.1x, for example, to identify the user on a group like Savvy that can, uh, so work of a group called Savvy, source address validation, that allow you to, uh, to, to map a port address, a port, uh, an address to a port. So this is some solution, but you don't have commercial products. So, of course you can, for test, you can run IPv6 in your network just to see that your server is working well, but you don't have all the management tools to run correctly an IPv6 network. And the problem is that here is not only to port existing tools to IPv6, but since we don't manage addresses the same way in IPv6, it means that we have to develop new tools. So if you want to create companies, it's maybe a good business to start to look at the way to manage IPv6 network from a company point of view. So another, another problem is the access. It means that it's good if you run uh, in your company IPv6 testbed, but you will not have connectivity. Because currently you have very, very few providers that gives you IPv6. So, for example, in France, you can go to France Telecom and say, I want IPv6 connectivity, and they will create for you an IPv6 connectivity. But this will be, for example, with lease lines. If you want to do it in ADSL, currently you don't have native solution to do IPv6 and ADSL. Because most of the DSLAM are routers now, and this DSLAM have to be updated to carry IPv6. Your provider box is also need also to be updated to have IPv6. And of course, if you are a provider and you make a release of a box and the system fails, then all your customers will complain. So you have to do it very, very carefully to add new functionalities. And that's why currently we don't have we have some provider, I will talk about free, a French provider, that most of all of these users have IPv6. But they are using 6RD solution, which is tunneling IPv6 into IPv4. So you, you have a lot of, uh, lot of problems here. And so here, the access is maybe the big problem for IPv6. And for core network, is not a problem. For core network, you have 6PE, and with 6PE, you can do what you want. So it's very easy here to, to carry IPv6. So, yeah, yes, I forgot to tell you that, for example, at Telecom Bretagne, we enjoy a lot IPv6. Our network manager also helps us to, to have IPv6 on networks, but if you look at the Wi-Fi network, uh, maybe uh, if you are logged to Invite, you have IPv6. Mm, I think so. Uh, in? in? Yes. Mm. But if you use, uh, for example, the website, so you have another SSID, 
and you have to use a website to connect so you identify yourself by your login and then you get access to the network this is only IPv4 because here we have a web that block the traffic before you are identified so this website block all the IPv4 traffic but doesn't block IPv6 traffic so you can access in that case you can access to IPv6 without any authentication and so we want to authenticate user so we have a problem so here it's really a bug from this uh, equipment piece of equipment the other network we have is Edurom Edurom is a network if you are in a any European university, you have your login and password from this university, you arrive at Telecom Bretagne and you can access to the web, uh, to the Wi-Fi network by using your university login and password. So this is done because you have some uh, access point that will contact the university to, to get uh, to know if you allow not to connect. The problem is that at the beginning you start with just a network to authentify yourself and then you move to the production network it works well with IPv4 it doesn't work with IPv6 so we have there is a bug in the US and so we cannot offer IPv6 here so it means that there is still some uh, bogus devices so if you want to run IPv6 in your company then you have to test the functionality before because it's not sure that it will work well even if you read or you see a very nice IPv6 logo on the page maybe the product will not behave correctly with IPv6 so you have to take care uh, about that and for example we have a firewall hardware firewall and it says to be IPv6 compliant but in fact it is not so we have to use another firewall for IPv6 because the good one we have bought doesn't know about IPv6. And in the when we bought it, we bought it because it was IPv6 compliant. So you have to test, be very careful with all these devices. Okay. So now another approach about uh, transition is to see all the working group IETF working group that works on, on how to integrate IPv6 in the network so the first one was the six bone so the six bone was at the beginning of IPv6 when we didn't have any IPv6 provider so the goal was to create a tunnel a network based on tunnels to uh, create IPv6 connectivity and this way you can test protocols and, and test applications so the six bone has disappeared uh, five years ago so it was the 6th June 2006 so the date was uh, well selected and this way this day they suppress it and now we are running so the prefix for the six bone was some something that start with 3 ff E, so 16. So these prefixes has been suppressed uh, since the 6th of June, and now we are running on prefixes that are two something, and these prefixes uh, are official prefixes managed by provider, and we don't have big tunnels in in the network. So the problem of 624 and we will uh, six bone, and we'll see a slide just after is that it's very easy to create a tunnel so I want to connect ETAM to Telecom Bretagne I, will, I have to type two lines on my router to create a tunnel at ETAM UCL has also to type two lines to create a tunnel and we have a direct connectivity at the IPv6 layer but in fact we are going to cross a lot of uh, routers IPv4 router, routers but we don't see it for example um, many years ago when I made a trust route between T 
Telecom Bretagne and ETAM. The packet were sent to um, Spain. So I don't remember if I told you, but it was a new kind of routing protocol. First, you select the Spanish language. And then, in Spain, the packet were sent to Japan. So it was not the Spanish language that uh, was the criteria for routing protocol. And from Japan, it go to Mexico. So it means that we cross in IPv4 a lot of tunnels, a lot of routers. But in IPv3, IPv6, it was only three, three jump, three up to Mexico. So that's the problem of tunnel is that you don't see the uh, physical topology of your network and you can create ugly things on it. So this is what was the first working group. The second working group was NG Trans. And NG Trans create a lot of tools to, uh, to, pro to put IPv6 in network. So we have also our tools, which was DSTM, a dual strike transition mechanism that has been developed by NG Trans. So there was a lot of tools, but nobody knows how to use it or why we should use it. So it was quite easy to, to get RFC, except for us. We never got an RFC for DSTM, but it was a lot of technical way to do transition, but no applicability cases. Then you, we got VCSOPS, and VCSOPS is a still a running uh, working group that try to look at different kind of networks. So they say, OK, we have provider network, managed network. We have unmanaged network. We have 3G networks. And we are going to see what are the missing points to put IPv6 in this network. And when we will have identified this missing point, then we will create solution to solve these problems. So that uh, was one solution. As our poor DSTM will disappear at, uh, at this time. You have a, another working group that works now, and that is based on tunneling. So how to create connectivity, IPv6 connectivity, using tunneling. And you have solution based on L2TP, so as you said before. And we have also 6PE or other solutions that are based on MPLS. And now they are working on other way to remove IPv4 from the network. So how we can install some gateways that will do the translation, and how we can share one IPv4 address among a lot of users. So all these things are done in the software working group. And you have a last working group that works on transition, is Behave. And Behave is mainly designed for NAT. So originally it was NAT uh, for IPv4. So what we call now NAT 4.4, because we have IPv4 in one place and IPv4 in another place. So I told you about NAT64. It means that on one side you have IPv6, on the other side you have IPv4. But we can imagine other kind of NAT. For example, you have NAT444. It means that you have a NAT in your home. You go to a NAT in your ISP, and then you go to a, a public address. And you can imagine NAT. Six, uh, 464, and here you are using IPv6 in the middle instead of IPv4. So you have all these categories of NAT, and if you want to imagine yours, for example, uh, 466 is not used, or 646 uh, extra, so you can uh, imagine a lot of solutions. What is very popular right now is NAT64, because it's an easy way, at least for the user, to have one, play, uh, one part of the network in IPv6 and the other part in IPv4. And we'll see uh, how it works. Here, as I said before the break, we, we see if before the break different way to, to look at the transition. Now I think the most, uh, the better approach to understand transition is to look at different kind of networks. This network can be uh, viewed from the VCSOPS working group. It means that you have ISP or uh, so network oper operators that will have to run a backbone. 
So to run this backbone, you have to forward IPv6 packet as fast as IPv4 packets. So you need a good quality and maybe you have invest in some equipment that are only running IPv4. So you have to find tricks to go through this equipment. You have also, of course, to interconnect with other groups, other providers. So you have to talk IPv6 or exchange traffic with other provider. So you have your uh, GIX, you remember what we saw in Mexico. So that have also to be IPv6. And the most difficult part currently for IPv6 is to have access. So to give IPv6 to your customer. It's quite easy to run an IPv6 network, but the last mile is always difficult to, uh, to manage in IPv6. So it means that you need connectivity, so you have to forward IPv6 frame, but you have also to manage this connectivity. It means that you have to allocate prefixes to customers, and you have also to log what you have done with your customer. Because if you have a judge that asks you as a provider to answer this question, who, give, uh, who has access to this website at uh, this time, you need to provide a log for legal reasons. And so you have to do it also for, uh, for IPv6. So we are going to see different ways to, uh, to do that, so the access and how to allocate prefixes. Then you have your company, company network. Maybe the most difficult place where you can introduce IPv6 because it's a manage, manage area. So manage area means that you have managers. So you have to convince managers that they have to move to IPv6. So this is one problem. The other problem is that uh, maybe all the equipment, all the devices are not well fitted for IPv6. Or the management tool are not well fitted for IPv6. So you will not put IPv6 everywhere, but you have to find places where you need IPv6, and you have to put IPv6 at these places, and some places where you can continue to run in IPv4. So, and if you move some places in IPv6, then you have to guarantee interoperability with IPv4. So here it's maybe where the, we have the most complex uh, place to, to put IPv6. Then you have unmanaged networks. So unmanaged networks are easier to, for IPv6 because you have no managers. You have only automatic things to do. So it's easier to push uh, IPv6 here. And here, of course, auto configuration will be uh, a good place uh, for IPv6. And you have last uh, bullets. I will not go into details for that. But you have to look, uh, you have also a 3G network. Or now, you, I know that you are specialist of that. Uh, you have LTE network. So and you have and this kind of network to also put IPv6. So if I don't uh, do uh, say any mistakes, now LTE has IPv6 on it. So it's embedded. All the features carry IPv6, so it will be... Uh, quite easy for this kind of uh, network. For 3GPP or other network, maybe it's more complex. So, if it works. No. So, core networks. Core networks is, uh, is not difficult. You have two solutions. Even you, either you have native transport, it means that you carry IPv6 and IPv4 on the same links, and you have a dual stack router. For example, Renater, Renater, which is a French uh, national research and education network. So Renater is running, so Renater is a network that gives you connectivity here at Telecom Bretagne, and Routers in Renater are running IPv4 and IPv6. 
So this way you have no problem because you you have router that knows the both protocols. And when you have a site, for example, it's very easy. For example, Telecom Bretagne. When Telecom Bretagne get access to to Renate and IPv6, Renate send a mail to us and say your prefix will be 2001-660-7301. So we will slash 48. So we receive this mail, we know about our prefix, and we configure our router for this prefix. So there is no, no problem from to manage this prefix because it was configured out of band by receiving a mail and doing configuration by ourselves on the routers. And we never move, we never change a prefix, so we are identified by this prefix on all the networks. So here, it's quite easy. But sometimes it's not so easy because, as I said before, you have some router here that are only, are V4 only. And if they are V4 only, then you have to find tricks to, to cross them. So one solution is, for example, here you have an IPv6 router, and you create a tunnel. So you put your IPv6 packet into an IPv4 packet and you cross this area using a tunnel and then you continue in IPv6. As we saw in Mexico, of course forwarding here IPv4 packet is not a problem, but creating a tunnel is a way to uh, uh, decrease your bandwidth because it's very complex to add the IPv4 either. So the throughput will not be as good as native packets. So the bottleneck will be when you encapsulate IPv6 into IPv4. So to avoid this, to avoid tunnels, the other solution is to use MPLS on a solution called 6PE. So here, and if you have this, you, uh, you can solve your problem. So I can say a tunnel, yes, uh, just but to be more clever, instead of tunnel, I can say 6 over 4. It means that I put IPv6 on IPv4. Yes? The MPLS mostly runs on the same carrier network, or it can cross? Here it's intra area. So it means that here you, you are in only one provider network. You may use it between different providers. But here it's no more, uh, this is no more this problem of transition. It's more how you can manage MPLS between different providers. And so that you have solution and when you will have the, the class with Viralin Texier, you will see in, inter-domain um, routing and how you can use MPLS to go from one domain to another one. So here, and when you have created your LSP, you can carry what you want on it. So it can be IPv4 and IPv6. But here for this solution of 6PE, it's internal to one domain. So routing protocols. Of course, if I am running natively IPv6 on my network, then I need routing protocol for IPv6. And we have very few slides that talks about routing protocol for IPv6 because it's almost the same. So remember that IPv6 is based on CIDR. So we have the same, w we manage a prefix the same way. And we are doing routing protocol the same way in IPv4 and IPv6. What we have to do is to adapt the routing protocol to the new uh, address uh, size. And that's what we have, for example, with RIP. So we have a RIP that uh, allow us to carry IPv6. OSPF is the same thing. OSPF is uh, you have a new version OSPF v3 for IPv6. So they develop new packet format, new message format for to carry IPv6 prefixes. But also the protocol has been changed to use link local addresses and all that stuff that are new for IPv6. So it's a new protocol that carry new things. And now you have some works 
that allow you to use OSPF v3 to carry also IPv4 packets. And the other protocol, which is very easy to, to move to IPv6, is IS2IS, because you remember that IS2IS was not running on IP, but was running on CLNNP, classless network uh, protocol. So it means that here you just have to change the information you carry. And if you look at the RFC that describe IPv6, IS, uh, IPv6 over IS to IS, then it's a few pages draft because it just defines a new structure of information you can carry. But you don't change a lot of things on IS to IS. So this is for interior gateway protocol. For exterior gateway protocol, so you have multi-protocol BGP. And with multi-protocol uh, BGP, then when you set up a uh, peering between two BGP routers, you negotiate and say, are you able to carry uh, or to talk IPv6? And if the other one say yes, then you, you send the information concerning, uh, regarding IPv6 uh, prefixes. So here, we talk already about that in uh, the class about BGP, but there is very few change in the concept. So there is, of course, you have to adapt things. OSPF maybe is the most difficult adaptation for IPv6, but the principles remain the same. So it's not really a problem. So here is a tunnel. So an example of a tunnel. So if I have some part of the network I cannot carry directly IPv6, so I put an IPv4 either in front, and I run my network. So, it's a good solution for if you don't have a lot of throughput. So, throughput. Because it's complex to add headers. So, maybe at the edge of the router, of the network, it can be good. But in the core network, where you have all the lines that go through uh, high-speed links, maybe it will be difficult to carry this kind of thing. So if you do tunneling on the edge, maybe it's a good solution. But not for all the, the case. And as I said before the break, the big problem with uh, this kind of solutions is that you, it's very, very easy to create a tunnel. It's just three line configuration of configuration into a router. So it means that I can create tunnel for everybody and I will not respect the physical topology of my network. And doing that, it can lead to, for example, this kind of networks. This is a vision of the six bone just before it's uh, finished, it stopped. And you see that it doesn't look really like a network. If you, even if you have never seen a uh, real network, you see that everybody is almost connected to everybody. And it's not what we have in uh, reality. So it means that here, for example, if I go from, uh, uh, let's say, um, Nortel to uh, BT Labs, I can see a link here. But this link maybe is not correct. And I go to China, or here I go to the US, I come back to, or if I take two European places, for example, uh, if I see some. Uh, I, for example, if I have two European countries, I can see a direct link at IPv6 level. We're looking at my tunnels, but they go to the US. And so I have to cross twice the Atlantic to uh, reach, for example, I'm in France, I'm sending in Belgium, and I go to the US. So it means that it's stupid if you look at the packet, but at IPv6, we will no, you will not see that. You will imagine a direct link between the two equipment. So that's a big problem, and you have to follow the network to topology if you want to use tunnels. But tunnel is a good solution, if you respect this. The only drawback is that here, of course, if you add an IPv4 header, then your MTU can be reduced. So if I have a MTU, so the maximum transmission unit of 1,500 bytes, if I add this, 20 bytes, 
So my maximum transmission unit will be 1480 bytes. So it means that here, PathMTU discovery can be very important. I remember you, uh, remind you what we saw in, in Mexico, the problem you may have with tunnels is that you, you send a thin packet to a server. The server answers you with a thin hack. Then you receive a hack. You send a hack. So here you open your TCP connection. And then you send an HTTP request get slash. And you will never receive the answer. So what happened, in fact, is that here the answer was a big packet. And here maybe you enter into a tunnel. And the answer was too big to enter into the tunnel. So here you got an ICMPv6 message telling packet too big. But you have a firewall in front of your site and packet too big is suppressed. So what happened here is that you may send an again a GET and here, same thing, your packet will be discarded at the, uh, the tunnel entrance. And here it's uh, very difficult to see this bug because when you do a ping, it works. When you do a telnet or SSH on the server, it works because you are sending small packets. It's only when you are sending big packets that you have troubles. And this may appear due to tunnels. So if you know that, in fact, the, the rule is never to filter ICMP uh, to big packets or messages. Or the other solution is to reduce the size of what you are sending to something smaller to go to, to tunnel. So um, this is one problem you, you may have this, uh, with that. So the other solution here I will normally I don't have to talk. You can describe it because we already saw it uh, during the class when we were looking at uh, MPLS and VPNs. So you can describe me uh, what do you do with uh, 6PE. You remember? So here is an overview of what we, we saw. You remember it was the four plane where you have um, BGP, IGP, uh, MPLS and uh, the FIB. And here it's just a vision from the top of, uh, of this network. So what do you have? You have here router B that is a dual stack network, a router. It talks IPv4 and IPv6. So we'll talk externally to this router that you, where you have beta in IPv6 and internally in IPv4. So gray routers here are IPv4 routers on this one IPv6 and maybe IPv4. So here you have two customers. So you are a provider that run an IPv6, an IPv4 network and you have two customers that wants to exchange IPv6 traffic. So how you, you solve that? First, of course, so look at the um, bottom here. So router A receive a BGP announcement in IPv6 that say, uh, I want to reach beta. Sorry, so it's not a router, sorry. Router A receive a packet, an IPv6 packet that say, I am alpha and I want to join beta. So what we will do is to add an MPLS label here. And this MPLS lab, in fact, we stack two labels and we reach that destination. So here maybe it's not very clear how it works. So you don't have 
copy here. But here, it's the same view. Maybe it's clearer here. So I have this router, these two red networks that are, IPv that are IPv6 only. OK? And inside here, I have a network, and especially a core network, that is only IPv4. My edge routers can be IPv4 only, if they talk only to IPv4 customer, and IPv6 and IPv4 if they talk to IPv6 customers. So here, they want, so these two, R2 and R3, are dual stack. So here, what do we do? We send BGP messages. And these BGP messages say, I have a prefix alpha in IPv6, so alpha 6 here. And the next stop is the IPv6 address of R1. And what do I do in the middle? I am sending a BGP announcement in IPv4 between R2 and R3. And in my BGP announcement, what do I, what do I say? I say that there is a prefix alpha 6. And I am associating a label to this prefix. So R2 select a free label that is not used. For example, here, label 60. To say, I associate this label 60 to alpha 6. And then, I will give a next stop. So the IP address of the router. So here I give the IPv4 address of R2, of this interface. So what I have written here, R2, uh, 4. In fact, there is a stupid rule in BGP that says that when you put the next stop, it must be at the same family address as the prefix. So I transform my IPv4 address into an IPv6 address by adding FFF in the, just, after the, just before the IPv4 address. OK? So when I have done that, this router R3 will have in this BGP table the fact that to join alpha 6, I have to send it to R24 with label 60. OK? So now when R4 send a packet, I use the label. And I know that I have to join alpha 6. I have to send it to R24 with label 60. But the question, so I can put label 60. But the question is, how can I join R24? So I have to find the label for the prefix of R24. So this is done by BGP and using, you remember, maybe you remember that the interaction between the IGP uh, with LDP. When you mix this, you exchange what you know, you exchange label. And this way you create a path and you know the label you can use. So here, by looking at this information, so I query my database and I ask what is the label I can use for the prefix of R24? And the answer is I have to use label 123. So what do I do? I send a packet. I send a frame here with the label 123 to reach the prefix of the router. And label 60, which was given by the router to reach alpha 6. So this packet is switch into my MPLS network and arrive to the last router which allow me to reach the prefix of router 2. So this router will suppress the prefix by doing a pop. So then I will just have label 60. And when I receive something on label 60, it's what I said here, is that label 60 is for prefix alpha 6. So after that, I know that label 60 means that I have an IPv6 packet. So normally, I will forward an IPv6, I will for give this packet to the IPv6 entity. And so this way, R3 will be able to forward the packet to alpha 6. OK? So if you remember, you, you may understand that very easily because 
you have, uh, we have seen that in Mexico, we have seen it again. And normally you will have also some practicals that will allow you, allow you to see it again for uh, 6PE so, and also for L2 VPN. So when you have done that, I just have to change my edge router to carry IPv6, but the rest of my network is unchanged and I can continue to carry, to, to have routers that knows only IPv4 packets. For example, this P router in the middle just see IPv4 traffic for BGP and MPLS traffic for IPv6. So MPLS means that they never go to the IP layer and stay in the MPLS plant, so there is uh, no problem to, to forward these packets. And this way you update your network to, uh, to IPv6. Okay, so that was what we saw. So we, we saw also in Mexico that the software working group has done the opposite. It means that I can have IPv4 network in the middle on IPv6. Uh, sorry, I can have IPv4 network at the edge on IPv6 network in the middle. So I can deploy now IPv6 network in my company, but even if I invest in IPv6, I can continue to, uh, to, uh, to have IPv4 traffic as transit. So it's a solution, for example, the Chinese provider are pushing because they develop, deploy a lot of IPv6 uh, core network and they want to use it to carry IPv4 traffic. So the only difficulty is that you have to, to put an, IPv4, an IPv6 next stop even if the prefix is IPv4. And we saw that we, we changed the law for, for that.